Good evening. Good evening and welcome. <laughs> Good evening and welcome to the Center for Jewish History. My name is Annie Polland. I'm the executive director of the American Jewish Historical Society. And we're so happy, we're so pleased to welcome you tonight to this very important, this very timely conversation about anti-Semitism in America and looking at American identity more broadly. Um, before we begin, I just want to acknowledge uh, Dr. Larry Cantor, who's here, who has sponsored this program, and I want to invite him up to say a few words. Thank you, Annie. Uh, Jack Coleman, uh, who probably most of you don't know, was an incredible human being, came from a family, uh, the Scheftel family, that landed in Savannah in 1733, shortly after Oglethorpe landed. So his family has a, a long history. I just want to say that uh, Jack died at the age of 95, and uh, I knew him for 40 years. Unfortunately, when you when you die, when you're really old, nobody knows who you are. And, uh, but I decided his family wanted to contribute something to this uh, society, and I've set up five years of a program that we're gonna have on a yearly basis in Jack Coleman's honor. He was an incredible guy at our synagogue in Jacksonville, Florida, uh, incredible human being for the Jewish community and the secular community. And for that, I'm really pleased to uh, to honor him uh, as a great human being and a family who's been in the United States for 286 years. Thank you. Thank you so much. I think that when people think of an archive, they think of a quiet place. Um, but one of the things that's very important for us is to make sure that history stays alive um, and to that and we have exhibitions, we have programs, um, but this memory that we heard tonight about uh, the Coleman family is really important too, because I think that when we're able to dedicate, um, the story continues and it's not forgotten. And I also wanna welcome um, Coleman descendants who are here tonight as well. And it's amazing to me because the Colemans came for a tour this afternoon and our archivists were able to take them into our collections, which look like this, let's see. Yeah, which doesn't seem that exciting. You're looking at a lot of boxes. <laughs> but inside the boxes are pieces of the story that tells uh, the story of the Jewish people, the Jewish people in America, the connections, what brought them here, their interactions with the broader society. And one of those boxes, or several of those boxes, actually are boxes that tell the story of the Sheftal family arriving in Georgia in the 1700s. So this is a very exciting place, and we're excited uh, to bring some of these stories to you. The, the topic we're going to talk about tonight is a topic that is disturbing, um, but it's important to be talking about it. So in that sense, I think that this is a constructive evening, um, one we've been looking forward to. And um, a few weeks ago, actually a few months ago, there was a kind of press conference here at the center about a uh, new curriculum being rolled out or a new bill to have curriculum on um, Holocaust education. And I thought this was an important endeavor. Um, but one of the things that struck me as the different politicians spoke and different heads of communal agencies spoke is that there was a way in which they were talking about um, in Holocaust, it's important to remember the Holocaust, survivors are dying, right, very good point. And then also there's a rise in anti-Semitism in America and connecting the two things. Um, and it's not that those things aren't connected, but what was missing was the history of anti-Semitism in America and how we understand how anti-Semitism pl has played out here over decades um, and how we can better understand perhaps what is happening today if we also add in this story. So this is a kind of impetus for this program. In February, the American Jewish Historical Society brought together three scholars of American Jewish history and asked them you know, to talk about this. And Tony Michaels, who is one of them, is with us today as well to continue that conversation even as we look at anti-Semitism as it manifests itself today. Um, but to go into our archives a little bit, I wanted to point out too that the American Jewish Historical Society was founded in 1892, and what you have here is a bit of the transcript of the first meeting. 
um, because they were a historical society, they did a really good job of taking record <laughs> of what was happening. And they were saying that they were founding this institution because they were proud of the history of Jews in America, and they wanted as many people to know about that history. Um, a history of Jews being free, a history of Jews contributing to society in a variety of ways. Um, but on page 15 or so of this 60-page document, there's a sentence, too. Someone, a professor of Har at Harvard, actually says, I think it's important for people to know about the contributions of Jews because maybe it will dispel some of the prejudice that still lingers in this country. And this is in 1892. So the very founding of this historical society was a moment of pride in history, but also a matter of concern over the prejudice that existed. Um, and the society has since collected 30 million documents, um, of which not all of them are about anti-Semitism, thankfully. There's so many other things that have happened. But one of the important collections um, that we have is the Board of Delegates of American Israelites, an organization that was founded in 1858, 1859, uh, in part as a reaction to anti-Semitism that had played out in Europe, um, the Mortara affair, where a young boy, Italian boy, had been baptized unbeknownst to his parents by a, a governess or a nanny who was worried about his health. Um, and then several years later came back and said, he's been baptized and they, the church took the, uh, took the boy, Edgar Martara. And communities in England and France and the United States, Jewish communities, had to figure out how to act. Um, and at that point, the American Jewish community, some members of it, formed this board of delegates of American Israelites. And this is actually uh, correspondence with um, President uh, Lincoln's government after a short-lived decree in which Jews were um, banned from certain areas uh, around Kentucky and Illinois. Um, there was also social anti-Semitism that came about in the 1870s, at which point established American Jews, many of them of Central European backgrounds, found that when they went to certain hotels, when they went to certain clubs, when they went to certain restaurants, they started to be banned for their, for their religion. Um, and this is something from our collection as well, talking about when Seligman, Joseph Seligman, who is a financier, was banned from um, the Saratoga, the Grand Union Hotel at Saratoga Springs. Um, and this idea of established American Jews causing problems found its way into images. And I want to be, uh, I want to contextualize this as well by saying that it wasn't just the Jews who were stereotyped every immigrant group who arrived in America, as well as native groups in America were stereotyped in a variety of different ways. Um, but I want to point out this one from 1882, and it's hard to read um, from your seats, but it says the Jews, uh, the dreams of the Jews realized. It's from 1882, and it's in, pu it's in the Judge uh, magazine. And what you see is um, established American Jews very, feeling very comfortable kind of watching the scene. And the broader scene is that signs are going down. John Smith Company, dry goods, established 1820, is going down. And what's going up? Names like S. Weinstein, or Lipheim, or Adolf Cohen, or um, a variety of Jewish names that are kind of taking over. Um, and so there's this kind of ominous looking group of Jews that look like they're running everything and in control as the old families are being, are being pushed out. Now, another part of anti-Semitism in America that's important to consider is that um, the historian Jonathan Sarna has pointed out that Jews have felt very comfortable in fighting anti-Semitism as soon as it's happened. So in the colonial period beyond, Jews, when they sense anti-Semitism happening, have spoken out. So that Board of Delegates of American Israelites is one example of Jews coming together to fight anti-Semitism as they saw it. Um, another element of this that I think is really important to note is when people who aren't Jewish have also spoken out about uh, anti-Semitism. And this is a, a collection we have that I, I just came upon about a, a, a reverend who led a church just a few blocks from here on 11th Street, um, Francis K. Shepard. Um, and in the 1930s, he wrote sermons against anti-Semitism. He wrote sermons against what was happening in Germany and also what was happening in the United States um, in a different way. Um, and what we have are this amazing file of letters from Jewish people who wrote in response to his sermon, saying, thank you so much. Thank you for speaking out. And they're really beautiful, heartfelt letters. Um, so I wanted to kind of add that to the story of anti-Semitism in America. 
Um, and finally, Emma Lazarus, those of you who know me know that I don't stop talking about Emma Lazarus. We have her collection, um, and we're, we're so proud to have her collection, the poet who wrote The New Colossus, which is now on the Statue of Liberty. Um, but one of, the things, one of the things that motivated her to act was a rise in anti-Semitism actually in, in Russia that led a whole uh, wave of East European Jews to come to these shores in large numbers. And she was very active in helping them. Um, but she was also a writer, and she wrote poems, and she wrote essays, and she wrote so many essays against anti-Semitism, explaining it, and, and all of that. And the last thing I'll say about Emma Lazarus, and I have much more to say, and you come to more programs and you'll learn more. Um, at one point, and this was in an essay she wrote to other Jews, basically to established Jews, saying, you need to do something for these East European Jews. You might think that they're different from you. They speak another language. But what she said is, until we are all of us free, we are none of us free, um, which is a statement that has since been used to talk about a whole variety of topics. But it's something that I wanted to end with because it's a motivating uh, force in a lot of the work that we do here at the American Jewish Historical Society. And so we're so pleased and so excited to be able to bring Eric Ward here to speak tonight about um, anti-Semitism, about white nationalism, and more broadly, about um, American identity. So um, Eric Ward will speak, um, and then uh, I, Tony Michaels and Christina Greer will join us in a conversation. I'm just going to read the bios pretty quickly. Um, so we can jump into the content. Um, but Eric Ward was appointed the executive director of Western State Center in October 2017. Before joining the center, Ward served as a program officer at the Ford Foundation and as a program executive at the Atlantic Philanthropies. A published author and off-sited speaker, Ward is a Southern Poverty Law Center fellow and the recipient of the Peabody Facebook Futures Media Award, the Arab American Association of New York Community Impact Award, and the Martin Luther King Jr. Leadership Award. Eric is also an awardee of the 2018 Soros New Executive Fund. Um, so he'll be speaking first, and I'm just going to read the intros um, for the panelists who will join. Later, Christina Greer is an associate professor of political science and American studies at Fordham University. Her primary research interests are racial and ethnic politics, American urban centers, presidential politics, and campaigns and elections. Her book, Black Ethnics, Race, Immigration, and the Pursuit of the American Dream, investigates the increasingly ethnically diverse black populations in the US from Africa and the Caribbean, and was the recipient of the W.E.B. Du Bois Best Book Award in 2014. Um, and you might recognize her when you see her, um, because if you have a television set, most likely you've seen her on the television set, as she's a frequent commentator on MSNBC. Um, Tony Michaels, um, you might have seen on TV as well. Um, he is the George L. Mossy Professor of American Jewish History and the director of the uh, Mossy Weinstein Center for Jewish Studies at the University of Wisconsin, perhaps the finest university in the world. Um, yes. Do we have some Madison people in here? Um, his research and teaching interests include American Jewish history, Yiddish culture, Russian Jewish history, socialism, working class history, and nationalism. Um, and his first book, A Fire in Their Hearts, Yiddish Socialists in New York, won the Salo Barone Prize from the American Academy for Jewish Research. So please join me in welcoming all of our panelists and first, Eric Ward. And thank you. <laughs> For those who, who don't know me well, I, I grew up Southern Baptist, and uh, that means I have to set a timer. Um, I'm so honored to be here tonight and to look at the faces in the audience. I think we are having an important conversation right now uh, in America about who is an American and what will America look like. It is not the first time we have had this conversation, nor will it be the last. But it is critical. And if nothing else happens this evening, I hope that people understand that this is your moment and your voice. And what you do in this moment will define what happens for generations to come. In many ways, it's your own story. And tonight I want to share some reflections through a story in my own. 
The story starts back in the uh, mid 80s. I live in Long Beach, California. I am young. I am African American and I am deeply seated in the punk community in Southern California. You start a band and in the midst of that band is a working poor kid who lives in a motel that my mom pays by the week. I realize there's not much future. And even though I love this band, I love LA, I have some friends who are moving up to Eugene, Oregon. And they asked me to go with them. Now I love these friends. So when they ask me if I'll move to Eugene, I look them in the eye, the love friends have for another. And I say to them, why would I ever move to Eugene, Oregon? If you could have opened up my head at the time, what you would have seen was San Francisco, a lot of trees, and the Space Needle, which wasn't even in Oregon, but Seattle. I had no idea what Oregon looked like, except trees. And I remember, and I say so with full embarrassment now, to my friends, do they have electricity? Is there MTV? Is there running water? And most importantly, do they even have McDonald's there? Now, I asked those questions because I simply didn't have much information. In my entire, at that point, 21 years, I had only been out of Southern California twice. I just didn't know. And when we don't know things, we begin to fill in those spaces and gaps with things that we think we know. This is the moment we find ourselves in now. We look at the incidences that have happened at the Tree of Life Synagogue, attacks on immigrants, attacks on black churches, attacks on Muslims. We look at the recent attack in Southern California and we think we understand what is happening in our country, but we really don't. What we've done is to fill in the gaps with things that we think we know. But what we think we know doesn't often help us respond to the things that are. I think about this a lot lately. Many people have asked me questions about the rise of white nationalism. Why? Because when I moved to Eugene, Oregon, which as you can guess, I did, very courageous. I was not the first person to decide to leave California and move up north. Some years earlier, another Southern California, Southern Californian from Orange County, retired aircraft engineer from Hughes Aircraft, World War II veteran and a pastor decided that he would make the trek from Orange County to the Pacific Northwest. He didn't pick Eugene, but a small place outside of Coeur d'Alene, Idaho, at a place called Hayden Lake. His name was Richard Butler. And Richard Butler was the pastor of the Aryan Nations, Jesus Christ Christian. Richard Butler's Christian identity taught three core beliefs. The first were that Jews were the literal children of Satan. The second was that people of color were subhuman. And the third was that white Northern Europeans were the true descendants of the tribes of Israel. More importantly, Richard Butler and those who followed him felt that they were in a war against what they called the Zionist Occupational Government, or Zog, and that the Pacific Northwest was to become the new Aryan homeland. 
Richard Butler and others made a call for white nationalists to relocate to the Pacific Northwest to create this Aryan homeland. And many neo-Nazis, Klansmen, and racist skinheads heeded that call. We often refer to that period as the Invisible War. Most of America wasn't aware of the murder and assassination of Alan Berg, a Jewish talk show radio host in Denver, who was gunned down by a group called The Order one evening, or the murder-beating death of Mulligator Sarah, an Ethiopian student on his way home from school who was attacked by a group of neo-Nazi skinheads who beat him to death with a baseball bat, armored car robberies in the tunes of millions of dollars. In the West, we learned something new. We learned that not all social movements come from the left or liberal spaces, that social movements were neutral in their tactics and strategies. That what was important was the ideology driving it. And that this movement, called white nationalism, sought the overthrow of the United States. And it was willing to use both legal and illegal means to do so. Many of us banded together over that period and we formed coalitions in rural and urban areas. I often tell some of my more radical friends, we were intersectional before intersectional was cool. We had to unite as a community. And we built coalitions where you would see rural Republican farmers sitting next to purpled-haired Mohawk punk rockers who may not have agreed on everything, about what the future held or how we got there, but we knew that white nationalism was not the answer. Working with national groups like the Anti-Defamation League and Southern Poverty Law Center, the Aryan Nations was defeated. As the Aryan Nations was defeated, we began to assess what was happening. And at that time, pre-internet, the way that we monitored was by gathering all kinds of information, attending meetings, listening to voice, outgoing voicemails, and most importantly, collecting flyers. Flyers that the white nationalist movement would leaflet or mail to individuals around the region. These flyers were anti-black, anti-immigrant, homophobic, misogynistic, you name it. But as we looked at these flyers, we began to notice something interesting. That nearly every anti-black flyer, homophobic flyer, is you know, um, anti-Muslim, that they all had some reference to what they called the Jew. It could be a stereotypical stereotype or trope, the Star of David, Zog, but it was rare to find a poster that didn't reference the Jew. Folks often ask me, why do I talk about anti-Semitism in America? And I think sometimes they want me to reflect some kind of interesting story, maybe about my neighbor or my best friend who saved me from drowning. But it wasn't any of that. At the end of the day, we saw something and we wanted to know what it meant. Me and other organizers from around that region. And in talking with experts like Ken Stern and Leonard Zeskin and others, a story began to unravel. One that shaped my work until today. The first thing that I understood was that there's a difference between white supremacy and white nationalism. And I want to talk about that for a second. White supremacy is a system, a system of discrimination and exploitation. It predates the United States. 
but is part of the founding of the United States of America. It was the rule of law, and it was built on the exploitation of black labor, the theft of native resources and native lands, and their genocide. And one we don't talk about a lot, the exploitation of women through the control of sexuality. These were the three cornerstones of white supremacy. And at its essence, white supremacy only worked by convincing a segment of the population that they were superior based on nothing more than their skin color. White superiority. Now I want folks to take a deep breath because it's important to say something. None of us in this room are responsible for the creation of white supremacy. None of us were there. It is both a historic and present day system. But it is what life looked like in America. But then something happens. Something we often refer to as the 1960s Civil Rights Movement. And later we will hear from individuals, and there are folks in the audience as well, who know that the 1960s Civil Rights Movement actually likely starts in the 1940s, with veterans returning from World War II. In fact, some of the biggest milestones of the 1960s Civil Rights Movement occur in the mid-1950s. Little Rock, the arrest of Rosa Parks. You may remember Rosa Parks. She was a black woman who one day was tired. And on that one day she was tired, she decided not to give up her seat. And because she didn't get up, give up her seat, she was arrested for violating racial segregation. And like manna from heaven, the next day, and for nearly 364 days after, everyone knew to just stay off the buses. One of the greatest miracles to ever happen in America. <laughs> and then, as the story gets told, one day, the bus association just decides that racial segregation was wrong and apologizes, ends it, and everyone lives happily forever. That's the story I was told in public school. Now we know it was much more than that. People organized. Rosa Parks was a longtime leader in her community. She was an advocate for women's rights. She confronted sexual violence in her community. And she was the secretary of the NAACP. She and others had met at Highlander to build strategies around taking on racial segregation in America. She was not the first to be arrested. She was part of a social movement. And that social movement ignited across the South. And by 1968 and 69, significant laws are put into place that begin to bring white supremacy as the rule of law to an end. Now, please don't walk out of here tonight saying Eric Ward said white supremacy doesn't exist in America anymore. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is that there was a point in history where it wasn't debated. It was not seen as anything but the air we breathe. And it is how people were born and how people died. There was resistance to it always, but white supremacy was du jour. So now imagine for a second, you believe in white supremacy. You don't debate it in your mind. It's just how life is. It's your identity. White people are superior, blacks are inferior. How do you then explain that you lost 
against black folks? How do you explain that you lost against people you fundamentally believe are inferior? Do you just say, well, I just got it wrong, I guess? Not if you're an arch segregationist. Not if you believe that the races should be separate. But when you suffer a huge defeat, you will look for an answer. And in looking for an answer, white nationalists draw on three specific areas. Generalized anti-Semitism that they have been socialized with. The influence of a man by Henry Ford, by the name of Henry Ford. You may have heard of him who through a magazine earlier in the 20s and 30s distributed a version of the Protocols of the Elders of Zion in his Dearborn Independent through a title called The International Jew. It was sold throughout auto dealerships around the country. But also, racists who had come back from the fight in Europe hearing about the protocols of the elders of Zion, hearing an idea that there was a global Jewish conspiracy to enslave Christianity, which became interpreted as white Christianity in the South. These segregationists found an answer that allowed them to hold on to their white superiority. And it was this. They didn't lose to black people because that's impossible. What they lost to was a Jewish conspiracy. That Jewish conspiracy became the heartbeat for the white nationalist movement. It became the answer to every defeat in terms of equality. Women asking for voting rights became a Jewish conspiracy. Immigrants asking not to be exploited were clearly a sign of a Jewish conspiracy. And as we saw most recently, immigrants, or sorry, refugees asking for asylum were no longer immigrants and refugees looking for asylum, but an invasion force run by a secret globalist conspiracy named George Soros. I've watched for the last two years as George Soros has been attacked on the media by elected officials under the guise of globalist. And sometimes I feel I'm the only person who knows <laughs> that they're not just talking about George Soros. This is not an attack on George Soros. This is an anti-Semitic trope. The white nationalist movement since the late 60s, has slowly moved from the margins to the mainstream, dragging anti-Semitism with it. We should be clear that the influence is real. It is arrogant for us to think that we are the only communities that can build social movements with agency, and that the only social movements that matter in America come out of the political left in liberal spaces. The white nationalist movement, too, has built its own movement with impact and effect. They have shifted the discourse on immigration. They have moved their ideology similar to one of my favorite pastimes, which is watching fashion shows. Love the little fashion show clips on TV have a little love and hate relationship because I love to sit there watching fashions come down the runway, so extreme, so way out there, never going to happen, and talk about how much I hate them. But I'm here to tell you today that I've been in enough department stores to know that those extreme fashions that no one is ever gonna wear are on the clothing racks within three to five years. They may not be as outlandish as what came out the, down the runway, 
But visually, you can tell. In the same way that the fashion industry seeks to influence what happens in the political and mainstream, uh, in the cultural mainstream of American life, so too does the white nationalist movement seek to influence what happens in the political mainstream of America. And it has been as successful. It is why the debate on immigration is no longer a policy debate about immigration numbers, but simply a discourse of immigration enforcement. Let's be clear. If white supremacy is about a system of exploitation, white nationalism is about the removal of people of color and Jews altogether. White nationalists do not seek to take us back in time, despite the Make America Great Again rhetoric. White nationalists see white supremacy as a failed experiment and are seeking something new. They are building off the chaos and debates in our society around demographic change, around economic inequality, and also the siloing of the political left in this country. I come out of the left in progressive movements. And we are isolated. We are like monks in a monastery, talking to ourselves, creating our own language, creating our own signals and worldview. In many ways, the political left now reminds me of the punk subculture that I grew up in, inward facing, looking for purity in language and action, rather than galvanizing the imagination of millions of Americans who are trying to imagine what the future looks like. So I will say this in closing. When people ask me, where is the anti-Semitism in the white nationalist movement? My response is that it is the fuel that drives the engine of white nationalism. And to defeat white nationalism means creating a real alternative. It also means taking steam out of its engine. But to take steam out of the engine means understanding what anti-Semitism is. It means acknowledging that hate groups don't come to town bringing white national or bringing anti-Semitism with them. They simply organize the anti-Semitism that already exists in society. The political left and the political right in this country don't create anti-Semitism. There are elements that are simply organizing it into political power. The goal of the white nationalist movement is not simply to spread anti-Semitism, but to use that anti-Semitism to seize the state. They will, if we don't learn to speak up and to diffuse anti-Semitism. We will not be able to build the coalitions we need without understanding anti-Semitism and forging new identities that are not reliant on racial nationalism. This is the time to speak up. I'll end this with this statement. I'm gonna take you back to Long Beach, California, where I'm a young kid in seventh and eighth grade. By the end of summer, we were completely out of resources. So was everyone else in my neighborhood. So we would pass the day by August, but usually sitting on the lawn. And sometimes we would start to play a game every summer. And it was called If I Were. And If I Were went like this. If I were in a lion's cage, and the lion got into the cage, here's how I would get out. And then we'd all talk about how we'd get out and if that was possible. 
If I were speeding down the freeway and the brakes went out, here's what I would do. And this one question would always come up. If I were in the midst of the civil rights movement, here's what I would do. Now we were kids and we were full of bravado. We didn't understand choiceless choices. We had lots of ideas about what we could or couldn't do. We were a generation who grew up not under racial segregation legally. We didn't understand the limits that our parents had to struggle in. So we went on and on. But that question always has haunted me my entire life. And I've always wondered for years, what would I have really done in the midst of the civil rights movement? You may have wondered this as well. Well, I'm here to tell you this evening, you no longer have to wonder. We are in a moment, an existential crisis in this country of identity. And if we will be a society of inclusion or exclusion, and each of us has a role, the truth is, is if you have ever wondered what you might have done in the midst of the civil rights movement, it is likely going to be the same thing you do when you walk out of this door today. This is an opportunity to have a conversation with amazing experts about the best way to walk out that door. When you walk out of that door this evening, you are walking into American history. And I encourage you all to make it count. Make your voice heard. Thank you. So we also want you to be part of the conversation, and so you should have received um, no cards. So as we're talking, if a question occurs to you, please write it down, and um, Shirley and Chelsea, people will be collecting them, and we'll bring them up. So after we've asked a few questions, we're going to turn to yours as well. Um, so thank you so much for that beautiful talk, and um, some of the ideas this idea, this narrative that you put out so convincingly um, is one that we see in, in your 2016, 2017 article, Skin in the Game, in which you also write that there is a lot of resistance to the idea that there is anti-Semitism in America. And I'm curious to hear, you know, where does this resistance come from? How have your talks across the country changed that in any way? And where do you see the most resistance to that, that idea that we have to fight anti-Semitism or that anti-Semitism is serious in any way? Yeah, so um, it quickly, my theory of change, right? I am a person who advocates for gender and racial equity um, in society. And right now, the best protector of that are uh, people and government institutions. And government institutions and those vulnerable communities are threatened right now by the rise of this white nationalist movement that is driven by anti-Semitism. The traditional responders to that would be the movements I have been part of my entire life. The political left, right, and liberal spaces, progressive spaces in America. We are stumbling right now around anti-Semitism for a number of reasons. We are stumbling because we live in a society that was shaped by black-white binary, right? And the skin color of many Jews, I think, makes it hard to understand that there are other forms of racism that function in society that don't look like anti-black racism, that don't look like anti-Latino uh, racism. Two is the structure of anti-Semitism itself, right? In actuality, if I'm being provocative, so I'm gonna be provocative right now, I'm in New York, so it's kind of like my third home, right? 
In um, New York, if you're not provocative, you're provocative. So. Right? So, look. So, the deal is this. At the end of the day, vulnerable communities are likely more vulnerable to anti-Semitism than the Jewish community itself. What anti-Semitism does is it denies the agency of people of color and other vulnerable communities. It says that our concerns are not legitimate grievances, that we are merely just puppets functioning in some type of conspiracy. It also teaches society, whether it's anti-Semitism is overt, where someone says the Jewish bankers, or whether they're not that clued in and just talk about the international banking conspiracy, right? It weakens belief in democratic institutions or that democratic in small d institutions matter. That's the danger of anti-Semitism. The third, I think, is a discourse around human rights in the Palestinian territories. And these three things have created a situation in the political left where we are not grappling with anti-Semitism very well. Typically, I would say, we have time to figure that out. If it were the 70s, if it were the 50s. But we are in 2019, and the white nationalist movement is on the march. It was part of a coalition that elected the President of the United States. It has taken lives over the last two years in Charlottesville, in Pittsburgh, right? In Portland, Oregon, where a white nationalist tried to murder two African-American women, one who was Muslim, and three white men stood up to defend them. And this white nationalist slit the throats of all three white men, two of them dying, right? On a streetcar in downtown Portland. At some point, we have to be we have to come to a moment where we understand there is a real social movement afoot and it is not grounded in inclusion. And if we don't take anti-Semitism seriously, we are not going to be able to defeat it. And we can't afford to make the mistakes that we could make in another era. We have to get anti-Semitism right. Thank you. Um, Tony, or Professor Michaels, um, you have done such a, you know, before people were really, there, there's a narrative in American Jewish history often of things getting better and better, a kind of positive, optimistic outlook that we see in a lot of works in American Jewish history. And in Fire, uh, a Fire in Their Hearts, in the introduction, you kind of took historians to task in a sense, in a very polite way, but pointing out, look, look what's been lost, and also look at look at the danger that we've ignored, and, and thinking about anti-Semitism. So I'm, I'm, what I'd love for you to talk about a little bit is the extent to which American Jewish historians have, have taken seriously anti-Semitism, and how prepared how prepared, how have they prepared us to deal with the kind of anti-Semitism that, um, that Eric Ward was just speaking about? In well, two minutes to, or less, to, just kidding. So to, to put it bl uh, politely but bluntly, um, the, the architects of the field of American Jewish history who wrote the, the people who wrote the, the books I studied uh, when I was in graduate school between the 1950s and let's say the turn of the 21st century, is this good? Uh, the people who built the field of American Jewish history um, for all the wonderful work they did in carving out a field of study, left, has, have left us entirely unprepared for understanding white nationalism um, because um, anti-Semitism was, was rarely considered in the, 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 the major books, the most influential books in the field. Um, the, the, the version of American Jewish history uh, that took shape in the second half of the 20th century and is still largely in place as something basically like this. Jews came to the United States seeking prosperity and freedom. They faced some hardships, some anti-Semitism at some earlier point in time, but they persisted, they struggled, and they overcame as America itself fulfilled its best um, aspirations and, and uh, promises. Um, so anti-Semitism in this 
framing um, was something that existed at some period of time in the United States, but it was never that serious anyway. Um, it was nothing like existed in the United States or elsewhere, and, and in any case, it disappeared. It withered away at some point in the second half of the 20th century, so there's almost nothing to talk about. Uh, I know. You know what? I'm just going to let you talk. <laughs> I'm not even going to ask you a question. You said you have so many thoughts. So. I, I, well, I do, because I, what you just said makes me think of who gets to control the narrative. I mean, we know that on the local, state, and national level, for over a century, there have been legal ways that this country has included and then excluded Jews in this country and then decided to include them again, then exclude them. Right. And Sometimes it's people like Robert Moses, who is Jewish, who has a certain disdain for that new type of Jewish, um, and he creates local segregation and housing practices against Jews. But I mean, Eric, your, your talk made me think about, you know, you said this three-pronged approach. I mean, I always talk about the four-pronged approach, which is white supremacy, anti-black racism, patriarchy, and the fourth that I add is capitalism. Because undergirding all of this, right, the movement of black bodies across continents, is capitalism, but the ways that white supremacy works and anti-Semitism works is to sort of have the shadow of capitalism to control these narratives about a certain group of people and what they are or are not doing. So for blacks, it's that they're not contributing to the economic sphere, and for Jews, it's that they're controlling everything in the economic sphere. So that's why for me, it's a, four, a four-legged table and not a three-pronged stool, um, because that's the shadow. And then you mentioned Highlander and Rosa Parks, which immediately, keep in mind, after the Pittsburgh Synagogue Massacre, we also had the Highlander arson, right? Days before, the three churches in, um, in Louisiana were arsoned. And so all of these are connected, sort of these synagogues and historical black churches, whether they're small and relatively unknown, or sort of something like Highlander, which we know was a very crucial space for allies and community and coalition building between blacks, Jews, and others for decades. And so the fact that it barely makes not even a back page story of the USA Today, um, is something to me that is worrisome because there's a certain level of commonplace uh, behavior that we're now experiencing where the arson of something like the Highlander Center and what it means and meant to so many people who were interested in this work um, is really dangerous. One of the, and with the Tree of Life, one of the most moving things that came from that, in, in my opinion, was when members of the church in Charleston that had been attacked uh, came to join together. And I guess my question is, how likely and how and where and what do we do? How do we bring communities together, uh, not after an attack, but to kind of work actively and proactively together to fight the um, fight white nationalism. So in other words, how do we not just react to tragedies, um, but to go to your point about we're now facing this moment where we have to act, how do we do that and where do we do that? I think, you know, part of it is I like honest conversations. And I think some of this is, and we've talked about this quite a bit, is recognizing the ways in which Jewish people over time have been able to, certain, not all, have been able to choose whiteness or not, whether it's based on geography, whether it's based on class, whether it's based on something else. And some of those allyships and relationships are harder to build and they're strained because, as there were some articles that came out, we were talking about this before we came on stage, thinking about someone like Michael Cohen. Granted, he's an extreme example. However, he chose to... He chose to make his living and live his life with someone who I would classify as a white supremacist, that person being the president of the United States currently, um, and ignore his own history and sort of the ways that his people have been used by people like Donald Trump and white supremacists. And so it was very frustrating where when he's talking to Congress and he says, you know, he's referencing his father, he's referencing the Holocaust, he's referencing the struggles of the Jewish people. And there are lots of folks who are like, we get it, we're with you. However, for 20 years, you were more than fine. Sort of paying the New York Times to say that five innocent boys were, you know, rapists and murderers. You were more than fine to sit there and like support and work with a hyper-racist agenda. And now that the rubber's hit the road, let's talk about this coalition building and like, you know, we're, we're the oppressed and chosen people 
in a different capacity. And so I think those hard conversations about historically where we've, we've been able to work together and then other times where legally or extra legally it, it hasn't worked out that way. Right, because even if Jews are white only provisionally, as, as you write, what does that then mean if there's been, if, if we think about Jews maybe becoming white after World War II and the, the return of um, Jewish soldiers and the way in which, you know, after fighting the Holocaust and fighting the Nazis, it was, it was really bad to be anti-Semitic in America, at least socially. And we could have movies like Gentleman's Agreement um, and all sorts of things in, in popular culture that are telling us we can't be anti-Semitic, and you have this kind of also Jewish movement more securely into the middle class. So we have, even if Jewish whiteness is provisional, it's existed in a certain way for maybe 70 years. So how do Jews show up? Um, yeah, well, I think there's one, there's something really important to understand, right? And we didn't used to have to say this in, in, in the 80s, right? the height of like third world feminist, like Barbara Smith, who like really, you know, would, would made this like a hegemony. But now I find myself having to, to repeat this just so folks know, right? Race is not a biological construction, right? It is a social construction. And it says much that we have to say that out loud, right? In um, left and liberal spaces today. Um, and how much is whiteness constructed? There's a great, I think it's Appleton, Wisconsin. It's a little historical society. And once they had, one time I was up there in uh, 2004. I see someone's from Appleton out there. Great place. Um, and um, there was this great letter on display from someone from Germany who was writing home to his family about kind of his life he was cutting trees way back. And um, he's talking about what a great time and what a great life he's having and that they would love it. And he says, you know, somewhere in there, he says something like, and the only, only weird thing is I'm the only white person there. Everyone else here is Swedish. <laughs> right? And if you're from Wisconsin, clearly that means something to you all. So there is this time at least, right? I don't know if it's official or legal, but there, is, there have been moments in history, at least, where whiteness is very fluid, right? And I talk to some of my Arab American friends who say very clearly, look, on September 10th, before September 11th, I was white. And I can tell you on September 12th, I was not white anymore, right? You can, Mexicans in the Southwest, right, after the annexation, were considered white for a while and then no longer white. Whiteness is a fluid term. I'm not sure even with that, that it's ever really applied, I've said, to the Jewish community, except as a temporal thing. And in a very dangerous way that anti-Semitism plays out, which is one of the ways anti-Semitism works as a system is to place Jews in a position between the haves and the have-nots, right? And um, we see this a lot in the American construction of how Jews have been afforded some temporal privilege. And I think it's really dangerous. Um, as a friend said to me a very long time ago from the Jewish community, he said, Eric, the thing you have to remember and repeat, right, is that at the moment Jews felt the most assimilated, right, in Europe, is when it became most dangerous. And he, what he meant is that the Jewish community should not believe the hype, right? And to understand that one of the ways anti-Semitism distinguishes itself is that it appears seemingly out of nowhere when it arises. Everyone seems to be very shocked when it appears. But what we know this time is it looks to be rising. And I think the Jewish community has to have a really serious conversation with itself about where it stands in this moment. And if we are going to take on anti-Semitism, it means building a broad enough coalition again, right, to take on that task. 
And that means dealing with patriarchy. That means dealing with income inequality in American society. It means dealing with anti-blackness um, in this society. So I think at, at the end of the day, we should understand whiteness is fluid. And at the end of the day, who gets to make the decision about who is white and who, not, who is not is society. But we should not in any way take on the hype. Uh, Tony, there have been moments where um, in history that you've documented where Jews have taken on a lot of the causes that were just listed, right? Fighting against inequality and so on. Um, and I guess my question is, to what extent is that history of Jews who were involved in, let's say, socialist movements or Jews who were involved just in the left in general, to what extent has that history um, become part of Jewish communal identity today? And is that is that a legacy that can be drawn upon in this? Uh, so the uh, can the so there was a, a everyone here probably knows this a lot of involvement of Jews in any number of social. Everyone probably knows about the storied involvement of Jews in socialist movements, labor struggles, the civil rights, and so forth, for good reason because there's a a real history there. Um, to what degree Jews can draw on that to be part of various social justice movements today? On the one hand, so I'd answer it this way, on the one hand, a lot of Jews do, especially young Jews, well, Jews of all ages draw on that because of personal ties, ideological affinities, our uncles, parents, grandmothers, and grandfathers were, were connected to these movements. It's something that's handed down through family, through synagogues, through youth movements, through all sorts of institutions and, and ideas and personal affiliations that make this part of a Jewish legacy in the minds of many Jews. On the other hand, um, it's become difficult for many Jews, especially young Jews, to be involved in socialist just, social justice causes in the recent years um, for two, two related reasons. One has to do with the rise of a considerable hostility to Israel in its very being existence and essence as distinct from um, the current government's policies. That's one problem for many young Jews on the left. The other has to do with the anti-Semitism that emerges from the anti-Israel movement, um, not, in, not, it's not all pervasive, but it's, it's there in the, 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 the point in which the current anti-Israel movement overlaps with white nationalism is around the theme of Jewish power. Um, that, that's, that's, there is um, a, a close relationship in, uh, between the, the white nationalist right and the anti-Zionist left when it comes to discussions of Jewish power. But bo both agree that Jews have a lot of it, uh, uh, too much of it, and they need to be, it needs to be identified, revealed, exposed, and, and in some way stopped. Um, so that being the case, it's tough. I know this, I know this from my own life, I know it from my students, I know it you know, the more I hear about it, the more I know it's hard that the Jews are dealing then with a legacy that they're proud of and a recurrent reality that, that, uh, that causes a, a great degree of um, uh, agitation. Right, so if a student were to walk into a meeting, for example, on a college campus yeah. and say, I'm not white, I'm Jewish, what would be the reaction? Probably a great deal of... Um, uh, 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 incredulity, uh, <laughs> um, uh, 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 disgust, um, dismissal, all sorts of things. I, I wouldn't recommend walking into a meeting and saying that, though. I mean, <laughs> I, I don't... No, no, I, 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 I let the record show I am not, I'm uh, not saying that you do. So, so, yeah, I don't think it's especially productive or accurate or the best way of framing the, situ the situation, but what I think you're, the, you're, the question you're pointing, uh, the question you're asking points to is a certain, let's say, lack of sympathy um, towards Jews and their concerns starting with anti-Semitism. There is a feeling that it is somehow something that Jews uh, exaggerate, inflate, and exploit. I want to invite you to ask each other questions as well. I have lots of questions. Um, and I know we're going to be taking questions as well from out there. But I'll, can I ask both questions and then you can decide, because I have a question for each of you. Um, so, I have a question 
I mean, white supremacy is built off the idea of uh, racial solidarity or, or, or um, that race is this real actualized definition. And we have responded, I think, um, the way, in one way that black folks have responded is through kind of our own racial solidarity. And I'm curious if there is a way in terms of identity construction, is there a way to have black solidarity um, without racial solidarity, right? Without buying into kind of the white supremacist. And is that even a way to be thinking about uh, this moment? Because I think the construction of identity is important. Another question for you, a little bit different. Uh, in terms of left and progressive identity, it was always my assumption that the left was actually good on anti-Semitism in American history. I now wonder if that's true. Okay, so what I discuss in my award-winning book. Um, <laughs> and if you haven't read it, you, sh you should read this. But I, I do make this point because, as you said, racial identity has been fluid in this country for so long, right? So the people who originally came here from England, you know, some people call them the founding fathers, some people call them the framers, some people call them criminals from Britain, like whatever, you can choose, right? And so they were a very specific group and it was whites versus the non-whites. And they got to pick and choose who could slowly but surely come into their group. And, and even that was fluid, right? Because there were different times that Jews were in and out. Um, the Italians were a little tentative, right? Irish, different times that they were in and out. Germans, Polish, Russians, you, we've seen this. Um, and so, but for such a long time, it was whites versus the non-whites. And I do fundamentally agree with you that this country, I think, will always be a dichotomous binary of black and white. Because the history of black America is the history of America. I mean, black folks have been in this country almost exactly as long as, as white folks. And so in the relationships that have existed have been complicated, to say the very least. But I do think that I don't ever see this country moving past this binary. And so the binary that we're in right now is blacks versus non-blacks. And people trying to stay out of what they perceive as a black category. Not necessarily as race, but something that's perceived as less than or last place. And so this is where you see immigrants who don't necessarily want to share solidarity. So when we see immigrants who support Trump or support policies that are completely antithetical to what they, they need, um, when you see poor people supporting uh, politicians who are gonna take away the ACA, right? Um, as I said last night, some of you may remember, you know, as LBJ said, if you can convince the poorest person that they're better than the Negro, you can pick his pockets all day long, right? And you can substitute Negro now for Mexican, undocumented, immigrant, whatever it may be. And so I think it's this black versus non-black category right now. And so we see an even more complex fluidity with other racial and ethnic groups who are just like, there's the solidarity that I have with, say, the blacks, but I don't want to be in that category because that doesn't seem like the winning team. That's not the powerful team, right? Even with Obama in the White House for eight years, that wasn't the winning team. And so because of real structures, racism, capitalism, anti-black racism, and, and white supremacy, um, that's where I think we are right now. And so how do we figure out these two buckets? Because I do think that there are two buckets, and that's pretty much it. So, you know, your perception that historically the left was uh, very good when it came to the question of anti-Semitism is accurate, especially, especially in this country. You know, the, what I mean here, the left, is anything sort of enough liberalism to communism, you know, the, the left to the far left. And the spectrum was, was um, uh, basically a non-anti-Semitic zone. It was a place where Jews were not, did not face discrimination or hostility. It was, these were political, it was in a political arena in which Jews were welcome and, and, and that their background was not held against them. At a time, now I'm talking about the first half of the 20th century or so, at a time when being Jewish meant that you couldn't live where you wanted to live in many cases or work where you wanted to work, if you were a member of a labor group or the Communist Party or the Socialist Party or whatever it was, you were welcomed. Uh, there's not a problem. And 
and and and and one rea- one result of that is that a lot of the left was Jewish, especially in New York City, especially in Chicago, and especially in Los Angeles and a few other places. Um, people on the left did not always have the most sophisticated understanding of anti-Semitism. All right, that, that, that's you know, why it exists, how it operates. That, that's a different question. You know, there was much to be desired sometimes. The few tended to be something like this. Anti-Semitism was a holdover from the Middle Ages, exploited by the ruling class to divide people. That was, and, and it was destined to disappear. Um, that, that was, it, it was a little simplistic. There's not a tendency to see it as something modern, rooted in modernity, something that could take on new forms um, and become deadly. The Holocaust changed that, where by the 1940s, almost anyone on the left grappled with anti-Semitism quite, quite seriously. Um, that's the past. <laughs> the, the present is, uh, the present reality is that, generally speaking, on the left, and I think especially for younger people, anti-Semitism is not taken seriously. At worst, it's, it's, it's enabled uh, or indulged in. Um, but generally not taken seriously. Now, this could be changing in the wake of the shootings of this past, you know, the past nine months. I think things could be changing. I'm not sure. But at least until recently, it was not something that was given much attention to. It was actually dismissed, um, uh, dismissed as, as, an issue, as an important issue that needed to be discussed for a, for a host of reasons. Um, so, Eric, I, I've read quite a bit of your, your work, which obviously most of the people in the room who have absolutely love the way your mind works. And you, you talk a lot about sort of this moral high ground and sort of like we have to take like this moral argument. And I guess my question for you is how do we do that in a fundamentally immoral nation? <laughs> I, I'm not saying that as a joke. <laughs> like, so, I mean, and so when I, I say that, you know, like time and time again, we're having these conversations. Let's just take the southern border, for example. I can't believe we're ripping away, you know, women from their children. We've always done that as a nation. That's du jour, right? We've done that for centuries, literally. So I found your writing to be very optimistic. Some days I am, some days I'm not. Um, but I, I just fundamentally, in a, in a country that honestly, we've never been honest about how rotten the roots of the beginning of this nation really are, how do we then move forward? Because we're essentially trying to prune this tree when the roots are rotten. I, I think it's, it's a good question. You were the first person who's ever said I'm optimistic. I love, I love that. I'm going to own that. Well, that means that. <laughs> um, you know, I'm hopeful. I don't know if that's the same thing as, 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 as optimistic. But I will say this. What I mean about uh, a moral high ground is that um, I don't look at... I, I know many people look at the United States as uh, uh, exceptional, right? And I mean, you know, exceptionally terrible or um, exceptionally, you know, amazing Right. I've never looked, I'm not a nationalist, right? At most, you know, you might describe me at times as, as a patriot, right? Um, and what I mean by that is there are not many nation states that don't have uh, really terrible histories, regardless of, most, not all, regardless of whether those atrocities took place on their territory right, or on other territories, right? This is the country I grew up in, so I know the, the, the terrible history um, and formation of it, um, um, I think, in, in much more detail. What I mean about a moral high ground, though, is that in this nation, there has always been a resistance to those atrocities, not always large, right, significant, um, but there has always been resistance. And it is that resistance where I find my hope. And it also says that there is, yet in the atrocity of, of history, there is something in this, in this country, again, not exceptional, 
but specific that helps see that kind of resistance, right? And to me, that is the morality of America. But I don't think we have been able to quite say to Germany what that seed is. But at the end of the day, what I suspect is that it's the belief that something can be better. And I'll use Martin Luther King as an example, right? Many of my friends, like, we're on the left, right? We're like, ah, Martin Luther King, Martin Luther King. You know, how many times are we going to hear about Martin Luther King, right? Um, whatever. You know, I'm, I'm an organizer, and I'll tell you, Martin Luther King had one of the tightest organizing strategies um, out there. And if you don't recognize that, you're probably not a good organizer, right? Um, and it was a morality of resistance. And I think about his last speech, and I have people use this last speech all, all the time, but I think about it this way as Martin Luther King the man. It is pretty apparent when Martin Luther King sees, uh, when he gives that speech at that point in his life, he clearly is fatalistic. He knows he's gonna die, or he believes it so much um, that he might as well know it. And you hear it in this speech. And he gets up and he says this speech in Detroit and other places. Um, but he says it, you know, uh, before he dies. You know it. Look, he says, I go, I've, I've been to the mountaintop, right? And I looked over the mountaintop and I saw the promised land, right? And he says, I may not get there with you, but I guarantee you as a people, we are going to get to the promised land. There is no optimism there. It is, it is a moral hope, right? Now, I don't know what Martin Luther King saw when he wrote this, right, and developed this speech. But whatever it is that he thought he saw, it was worth dying for. My sense is that, frankly, I want to see what that is. Because I think whatever that is may be the only way we get out of this, right? Because this is not the answer to white nationalism, right? The past doesn't compete against white nationalist revolutionary vision. We have to go someplace forward. And I'm fairly sure we don't get there without going all together, right? So I don't know what that future is, but my hope is that I'm gonna drag everyone kicking and streaming, right, up that mountaintop, because I wanna get out of this. If our thought is that if we just defeat Donald Trump, right, or if we just arrest enough white nationalists, we can go back to business as usual, it means you are not aware of the deep inequality that millions of Americans have been living in for decades right? The white nationalist movement is attracting in a base, based both off of, you know, fear of demographic change, but also the amazing amount of inequality in our society that has alienated people so much that they're willing to allow their racism to consume themselves, right? That is not a society any of us should perpetuate. So when I talk about moralism, I talk about the vision of resistors throughout history, and I talk about the highest ideas that America said that it wanted to be. And I feel that the only thing we can do is to push America in that direction unapologetically. And now I'm gonna talk about Derek Bell and I'm gonna shut up. Derek Bell in Faces at the Bottom of the Well, The Permanence of Racism in America, really the permanence of anti-blackness in America, says in the introduction, I actually don't think we'll ever defeat racism in America, right? This is a respected civil rights strategist and theorist, right? And then he says something really powerful, which is the moralism. He says, and we shouldn't fight racism because we think we're gonna defeat it. We should fight it simply because it is the right thing to do. 
It is what makes us human. And it distinguishes us against the inhumanity that exists in our world, both past and present. So we fight. There's a, a range of questions. Uh, <laughs> there's questions. We'll still get there's to the questions. questions. Um, one of the, I'm just going to throw out a couple topics rather than read the specific questions. But one of the things that people are interested in learning about your thoughts on uh, the current election and places where these conversations might happen in the election and. anti-Semitism as well as um, fighting racism. So what, what opportunity does this election allow for these kinds of conversations, if at all? Well, I follow the elections pretty closely. Um, and unfortunately, uh, we know that you know it's only May and uh, we've got a very long road ahead of us, which probably means that we'll have a lot more tragedies and massacres in places of worship. And I think we should really push our Democratic candidates to give us more than thoughts and prayers mm -hmm. and a real policy agenda as to how you want to, you know, fight this moral high ground. Because it's, um, it, it's unfortunately very commonplace. And I think a lot of times people want to go the gun route and give us a policy on guns, which is important, but we can walk and chew gum at the same time, where we have to sort of have a structural policy about how are we actually gonna combat anti-Semitism. I mean, these synagogues are targeted for a reason. These black churches are targeted for a reason. These mosques are targeted for a reason. Um, it's not coincidental. And so it, it has to be a policy perspective for anti-Semitism, anti-Muslim sentiments, and, and anti-racism. And what can people do then to make sure these conversations are happening? So if, our, if, our, if the candidates are not having these conversations necessarily, if the candidates are not bringing this up as a topic necessarily, where are the places that people can have these conversations and move, move things forward? For me. So if I was going to organize a national campaign, um, but I'll leave it to the national experts. Um, if you want to move candidates, right, you have to organize and be at those candidate forums. You have to be at the precinct level, and you have to sound like a broken tape recorder. Um, and you have to say it and demand it over and over again. And don't buy the rhetoric right, that talking about these issues are going to alienate, right, a base. It's not true, right? Um, what it is going to do is build a priority of issues that are critically important. With that said, right, it is important that we highlight and prioritize these issues and yet show what I call adulting in politics and realize at the end of the day what most Americans care about, right, or how to live, love, and work, right? Housing, education, healthcare, the promise for a better society, right, is critically important. But as said here, we can walk and chew gum, right? We are the progressive liberal space. We are actually very good at complexity and nuance when we want it. And this is the time to show that. If candidates are not talking about this issue, that's on us, not them. Um, I think there'll be more time for conversation outside. We have a reception. Um, so we can sweeten the conversation um, as well. But I want to take the opportunity to thank Eric Ward and Tony Michaels and Christina Greer and also... Um, I want to thank um, Larry Cantor and the Coleman family. Um, and I also want to thank all of you for coming to be part of this community and to have this conversation. And I hope to see you again. Please become, <laughs> please become a member of the American Jewish Historical Society. That helps us have these conversations. It's a very easy thing to do. Thank you.